Amen. We're going to go ahead and get started tonight. Amen. Uh, we're going to sing that song, There is Power. There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood. Hay poder, hay poder, poder, signo al poder en Jesús que murió. Hay poder, poder, sin igual poder en la sangre de Jesús. Hay poder, poder, sin igual poder, en Jesús que murió. Hay poder, poder, sin igual poder, en la sangre de... There is power, there is power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Amen. Let's go ahead and stand up. We're going to sing that song, Celebrate, Jesus Celebrate. <clears throat> celebrate, Jesus, celebrate. Celebrate, Jesus, celebrate. Celebrate, Jesus, celebrate. celebrate Jesus, he has risen, he has risen, he has risen, and he lives forevermore, he has risen, he has risen, come on and celebrate. The resurrection of the Lord. Celebrate, Jesus, celebrate. Celebrate, Jesus, celebrate. Celebrate, Jesus, celebrate. Celebrate, Jesus, celebrate. He has risen, he has risen, and he lives forevermore. He has risen, he has risen. Come on and celebrate. The resurrection of the Lord. Celebrate, Jesus, celebrate. Celebrate, Jesus, celebrate. Celebrate, Jesus, celebrate. Celebrate. Jesus celebrate. He has risen, he has risen, and he lives forevermore. He has risen, he has risen. Come on and celebrate. The resurrection of the Lord. Celebrate, Jesus, celebrate. Celebrate, Jesus, celebrate. Celebrate, Jesus, celebrate. Celebrate, Jesus, celebrate. He has risen, 
He has risen and he lives forevermore. He has risen, he has risen. Come on and celebrate the resurrection of the... Let's go ahead and give God thanks this night, Lord God. We lift you up, Lord God, in praise, Lord God. We worship your name, Lord God, for you are King of King, God, and Lord of Lords, God, and you deserve all our praise, Lord God. Worthy is your name, Lord God. I thank you, God, for everything you do, Lord God, in this place. I praise you, Lord God. I worship you, Lord God, and give you all the praise, Lord God, for you are Lord God and our Savior, Lord God, in Jesus' name. <laughs> Amen. We're going to slow it down. We're going to sing that song, You Are My All in All. You are my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I seek. You are my all in all. Seeking you as a precious jewel. Lord, to give up, I be a fool. You are my all in all. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Jesus, Lamb of God, sin my cross my shame rising again i'll bless your name you are my all in all when i fall down you pick me up when i am dry you fill my cup you are my all in all jesus lamb of god jesus Lamb of God, worthy is your name, Jesus. Lamb of God, worthy is your, you are my strength. You are my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I see. You are my all in all. Seeking you as a precious jewel. Lord, to give up, I be a fool. You are my all in. Jesus, Lamb of God, sing it out. Jesus, Lamb of God. Lamb of God and worthy is singing with all your heart taking my sin taking my sin my cross my shame rising again I bless your name you are my all in all when I fall down when I fall down you pick me up when I am dry, you fill my cup. You are my all in all. Lift your voice, sing it out. Jesus, Lamb of God, and worthy is your name. Jesus, Lamb of God. Your name, sing it again, no music, sing it out. And Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Jesus, Lamb of God, and worthy is 
Oh, let's give him praise tonight and glory, Jesus. We love and worship and exalt you, Lord. You are our King and our Lord and our God and our Savior. Blessed be Jesus Christ, the Lord of lords and King of kings. Hallelujah. Amen. What a fitting song to sing on Wednesday night. Amen. Jesus, the Lamb of God, when I am weak, uh, he makes me strong. Hallelujah. And there is strength for us through Jesus, our Lord. And uh, he made a powerful statement, the Lord Jesus did. Paul was praying in uh, 1 Corinthians, and he's talking about how he has a thorn in the flesh. He has an issue that is agitating him, that is pricking against him, that is, amen, annoying, that is painful. And he's seeking God. He's saying, God, come on, help me with this. Get rid of this thing. Uh, but Jesus came and gave him a little bit of a different answer. We all want the answer of God, eliminate everything that's a problem to me. And that's what Paul was praying for. But Jesus came with a different answer. And he says, hey, 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 my grace is sufficient for you. Because my strength is made perfect in your weakness. And what Paul says out of that, he says, from now on, when I'm in trouble, I'm going to glory in that. Not because I'm in trouble, but because his strength is going to be my portion in the weakness, right? The, think about it. The place Jesus' strength is the strongest is where you are the weakest. That's good news tonight, brother and sister. It means whatever we're going through, and I do believe God can break through. I do believe God, and he will heal some things. But other times he allows it so that we learn to rely on him, and we learn to trust him with our lives. So I want to encourage you tonight. Bring to the Lord whatever that thorn might be, whatever that issue might be, and believe him to help you and touch you and, and get, get uh, rid of that. But also cry out for his grace to be sufficient for you, amen, his strength to be made perfect in weakness. I've lived for God for a while. I know there's times I've prayed for things that hasn't immediately happened. So what then? Do I just quit? Do I just give up? No, no, no. God's strength is sufficient. Amen. He helps me. And I encourage you in that tonight. Speak your needs before the Lord. How many of something of a burden you want to put on God's shoulders tonight? Amen. Just say, you know what, Lord Jesus, I trust you. I need your strength in this area. And he's so faithful to help us, brother and sister. We want to pray healing uh, for Kim and Alan uh, from Yuli's school. Uh, healing for COVID. Also Israel and Anna, the Gonzalez family for healing uh, other issues. We also want to pray salvation and healing for Lorraine and Rudy. Alex Medina, Jose Martinez had a heart attack, needs a miracle of God. Also, we want to pray for the Martinez family for salvation. Uh, also, amen, uh, Angie, uh, been working, uh, but her boss uh, has tested positive and uh, she needs to be tested as well. Just God's grace to be over our sister, that God to be with her uh, in this time. We also want to remember, amen, uh, all those in the church, amen, uh, that are uh, laboring, amen, your jobs, your finances, your families, amen, your homes, your marriages. God to bless and be with every one of us. We need God in these times. We need the Lord's strength. We want to pray for our daughter churches. Let's not forget them tonight, our missionary down in Mexico, Brother uh, Aronufo and Sister Jessica. Uh, also, God, to move for Junior and Tamara as they're laboring there in Worcester, South Africa, back home and back at it. Just God's grace to be upon them. We also want to lift up our service tonight. God, to meet with us and change us and help us tonight and minister his word to us. We want to believe God together for these things. Let's pray together, brother and sister. Brother Juan's going to come and open us in a word of prayer. Let's pray. God, we come before you uh, in the name of Jesus, God. God, we call upon you for your strength in our weaknesses. We ask you for your power and dominion and might to be released, God, upon our lives and in our church. Praying, God, for every brother and sister, every family, God, pour out your grace. Heal, God, from this virus, God, we rebuke it in Jesus' name. Loosing your power and touch, Lord, in every need and circumstance. 
Padre Celestial, vinemos, Señor, en este lugar, mi Dios, ante tu presencia, Señor, pidiéndote, Señor, que tú te muevas con poder, mi Dios, en cada una de las necesidades que se mencionaron en este día, Padre. Te pidemos, Señor, por las hijas iglesias, que tú te sigas moviendo en cada una de ellas, Padre Dios. Oramos por milagros sobrenaturales en esta iglesia, Padre de sanidad, Padre Dios. Te pidemos por tu presencia, tu espíritu en este lugar, que tú te muevas, Padre, que tú ministres a nuestra vida en esta noche, en el nombre nombre de Jesucristo. Amén. Gracias Dios del cielo. Thank you Juan. Amen. You can be seated tonight. Hallelujah. It's good to see every one of you and we want to welcome all of you out to our evening service tonight. Amen. Here at the Door Church in Peoria. We thank you for coming tonight and uh, may God richly bless you those online. We want to welcome you as well. And uh, we appreciate all of you being here on a Wednesday and uh, fighting the traffic and, uh, amen, getting home from work, getting ready, all that's involved with a Wednesday night, and may God richly bless you for it. Amen. We do want to give you a few announcements. Uh, tomorrow night, uh, all the parents need to listen right here. Tomorrow night, there's going to be a practice for the Children's Church play, specifically if your kids have a part that they have a script and they're learning lines Uh, Lalo and Monica need to work with them tomorrow night at six o'clock. So they need to be here at six. And then how long, Lalo, how long is this supposed to last? Uh, over an hour. Overnight? Hey, date night. Oh, no, just kidding. But what is it, an hour? Yeah. Hour and a half. Okay, so <laughs> amen. Uh, hour, hour and a half. And uh, if you can have them here right at six, and uh, they will work with them. We're looking forward to our kids, amen, this year doing another play. And uh, looking forward to our, our children ministering for the Lord. And thank you, Lalo and Monica, for all your work in that already. But that'll be tomorrow night at six, uh, everybody, for your kids that have speaking parts. Then Friday night at seven is our Bible studies. Brother Lupe, Brother Abel will be doing those. And then uh, on Saturday, now we don't have any outreaches or anything scheduled because uh, there's a wedding on Saturday. Uh, Rosie's going to be marrying John Hendershot, uh, and uh, that'll be here at the church. But just as a little note on that, that's a private ceremony, uh, immediate family only. So that's parents and siblings. That's it. Uh, that can come. Uh, but there's an open reception for everyone in the church that's in, uh, invited at two o'clock out at Richard and Carmen's in Waddell, uh, basically California. And uh, amen. It's going to be out uh, that direction. They're going to be hosting that. All the family uh, and the church is, of course, is welcome there at two o'clock. Uh, but just uh, that'll be at two out at Richard and Carmen's. And we're leaving the schedule open for that day. Uh, so everyone can be involved with that. We're looking forward to John and Rosie and uh, all that God's going to do in their life. Amen. We'll miss her. Hallelujah. Uh, but I'm believing God that if we, we trade away, you know, a young lady, that some other young ladies come. So come on, young men. Get, get busy. Hallelujah. Go find them women. We've already traded them away. Vero left. Rosie's leaving. Come on, brothers. Amen. Get them in. Bring them, at, bring them back. Okay? So if you're a single guy here of marrying age, I'm talking to you. Hallelujah. So we need your help uh, to build the church. Hallelujah. And uh, amen. We appreciate, amen, uh, them and looking forward to that. So then Sunday, all day for Jesus, 10 a.m., our Sunday school uh, called Free Indeed. We've been having an outstanding time. Uh, Pastor Robert Morris's ministry. That'll be at 10, 11 a.m. and 6.30 p.m. You don't want to miss it. Pastor Victor Vargas is going to be preaching both services. Amen. Back in Peoria for a time of ministry. Uh, mighty work of restoration in his and Kimberly's life. And we're looking forward to having him come and preach before they go to Brazil. And so we're looking forward to that on Sunday. Then two date dates out in December, so everyone's aware of it. December the 20th. The Sunday before Christmas in the night service is going to be the kids' Christmas play. So everyone's aware of that. That's when it will be. And then December 31st is a Thursday night this year. We're going to have our No Talent Talent show again. And uh, John DeVivo is already asking me if we're doing it. I, don't, I think he's getting some more jokes worked up. <laughs> And I want to see Abel laughing again where he couldn't talk. Amen. That happened last time. Because Philemon came in like the green guy, the Hulk. I don't know what that was. I was all in Spanish, but it was hilarious to Abel. And so to me, it was, it was hilarious. And so we always have a good time at those. And uh, amen. Uh, I just want to encourage you out for that. 
uh, ending the year together as the church. And if you're going to be doing something that night and you are able to sing or do an act or whatever, uh, please get that information to Brother Lupe. He'll be heading it up, and uh, that'll be a real blessing. Amen. So that's all the announcements tonight. Let's have our ushers come. We want to receive God's tithe and our offerings besides. Amen. Luke 16, 9. Jesus said, make to yourselves friends of the mammon of unrighteousness, that when you fail or when you die, they may receive you into everlasting habitations. This is a very interesting scripture, very powerful truth. It means that uh, when we are spending our money, which we all spend money, it's a normal part of life. The question is, how much of the money that I am spending is influencing someone else for eternity? Because this scripture talks about how mammon or money can be made to be your friend in eternity, in heaven. So how many of you know, no matter how nice they are to you at Kohl's or Target or Walmart, they're not your friends. They just want your money, right? And so the amazing thing is the potential of money is that when we give money in the offering, it influences people for eternity. Think about this. Think about this. People in this church have given. And we just had Junior here about a week ago, Junior Smith, and he showed us on the screen that there's some people whose souls, think about this, the gospel came into their life. They're in the way of sin. They have no hope. They're in darkness. The gospel came. And now those lives are completely turned around. Th these are the people that walk five miles one way to church. And their lives are being changed for eternity. They're born again. And think about this. Like Junior said, you and I may never go to South Africa. But those people, if you gave to South Africa, they will meet you in heaven. And they will say, that little girl with that little dress on and that mask, five years old, no parents. Junior told us after at dinner that she just stays wherever somebody lets her stay for the night. She has no parents. That little girl will come up to you in heaven and say, thank you for giving. And Jesus said, you can take money and you can make a friend in eternity. Because it says there, when you fail, when you die, they will receive you into everlasting habitations. That means the givers to world evangelism, the people that use money in giving, will have a line in heaven waiting for them. Because thank God we have a vision in our fellowship that works, that people really are getting saved. There'll be people from Zacatecas. There'll be people... Uh, from other places, and I was thinking about our church. People from South Africa, people in Sinalto, there'll be people that are from Brazil, because, you know, this church launched a pastor to Brazil in the past. There'll be people from Moldova, from Malta, because, you see, when we give to Tempe, money goes to those places. The Philippines, there'll be people from Thailand, they'll greet you like this. That's how they do it in Thailand. And India, does everyone remember the halls went to India from this church? And we gave in the past to that place. And I want to tell you, you may not remember even giving to those things, but God remembers. And those people remember, and they'll greet you in heaven. And I can guarantee you, when we're part of our fellowship, when we do what we do, where we give faithfully and steadily, we just gave at the men's rally for Laos. I don't know if I'll ever get to Laos, but there'll be people there that I will meet because I gave. That's what this is talking about. So think about the potential of your money. That Jesus said you can make friends 
that will receive you in everlasting habitations. It's a powerful thing that our money can do for God and also for people and for our own blessing as well. So I want to encourage you. There are amazing dynamics released when we give to world evangelism, and uh, there are souls that will receive us into heaven when we get there. And I want to encourage you to have a vision for your own money that God can use it in that way. Let's give together tonight, bowing our heads. Amen. Uh, Brother Javier, please pray. There's power. There's power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Man, test. Took my jacket off. It's like summer and Christmas time. We were talking to Eva today. She came over for lunch, and uh, we were reminding her that, you know, in South Africa, their weather is the opposite of here. So Junior and them are over there in Christmas time, but it's summer. <clears throat> it's the total opposite weather, which is weird. So all the songs about snow make no sense in Australia or South Africa, uh, it's totally different. It actually doesn't make sense for us either because <laughs> there's no snow here. But anyways, amen. Joel chapter 2 tonight, if you have your Bibles. Amen. Evelyn, you can go ahead and put up that first picture for me. It's an article from a couple of years ago I wanted to use tonight, and it was a Corvette museum, uh, amen, back in Kentucky that had many uh, very, very pricey and rare Corvettes uh, that were there. This is a picture of inside, and it has numbers on them, and I'll, I'll tell you why in a minute, because basically what happened is a 40-foot by 25-foot sinkhole opened up in the bottom of this uh, thing. Go ahead to the next picture, and all about seven or eight of those Corvettes fell in there. And Corvette's my dream car, brother and sister. That's the one. When I was a teenager, I got to get a Corvette. And so my heart was breaking, hey amen, seeing these. So the list of cars that went down the hole, a 1962 black Corvette, a 1984 PPG pace car, a 2009 ZR1 Blue Devil, the 1992 white one millionth Corvette, 93 ruby red 40th anniversary Corvette, an 01 mallet hammer Z06 Corvette, an 09 white 1.5 millionth Corvette, and a 93 ZR1 Spider. So these all fell in there, but you know what's amazing is that GM said, you know what? We want to restore those Corvettes. We want to repair them. So go ahead to the next screen. So again, this is all of them there, but number four is the one I want you to focus on. That's the one millionth Corvette. It's a white 1992 convertible red leather <laughs> stinking beautiful car. Uh, that's it underneath all the rubble. Number four is where it is. So go ahead to the next one. That's the car after they got it out. Okay, there's another couple pictures of damage. Hold on, stop right there. No, go back. See all that dirt? <laughs> right, the, obviously that's small compared to the rest of it, but it's completely thrashed. And that car, I don't think they gave a value in the article because it's ridiculous, the amount of money that it is. Go ahead to the next one. This is the interior. 
That's all rocks that filled up the interior of the car. And, uh, and so they, they worked to restore it. And go ahead, Evelyn. That's the finished restoration pro project. Go ahead. It's beautiful, man. It's okay. Leave that one up. There are times, brother and sister, when we sink and we get damaged. And we need an expert to work restoration in our lives. One of the greatest of God's many miracles is the miracle of restoration in a human life. God restores relationships between himself, the most holy God, and sinful man. He restores relationships between brethren and the church. He can restore relationships in families. And he can restore backsliders. Amen. People that have left, they've been damaged. And I want to declare tonight to everyone here, as well as if you're online, there is hope for every person alive. Yeah. Come on. We serve the ultimate restorer. Yes. And I want to preach about that tonight. Joel 2, 25 through 29. I will restore to you the years... The locust has eaten the canker worm, the caterpillar, the palmer worm, the great army, which I sent among you. And you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God that has dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never be ashamed. And you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel and that I am the Lord your God and none else. And my people shall never be ashamed. Be ashamed. It shall come to pass after this that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also on the servants and in the handmaidens in those days will I pour out my spirit. Amen. The ultimate restorer. So let's think first of all about what God restores. There's a number of things the scripture teaches us that God restores. One of them is the soul, because all of us, our soul is weak and goes wandering. Psalm 23, verse 3, He restores my soul. The word restores means to deliver again or recover, to turn back to God or repair. And if you remember, the Sunday school I did on Psalm 23 talked about sheep, that sheep are very top-heavy, they have very thin legs, they don't have good balance, and they easily fall over, and the term is cast, the sheep gets cast, and when a sheep falls over, they cannot get themselves back up. They are fallen down and often they fall on their back and their legs are waving up in the air. And the problem is with a sheep, if they don't stand up quickly, they will die because the cud in their stomach starts to expand, the gases expand, the blood flow stops, and a sheep will die. If it's a sunny day, they have hours to live. If it's a cloudy day, they may have a couple days. The only hope for a soul or a sheep that is cast is if the shepherd comes and puts them back up on their feet. Luke 15, Jesus tells the story in 4 through 7 of a lost sheep. Do you know we're sheep? We're the sheep of God's pasture, right? We're the sheep. And the sheep has been lost. This sheep has wandered away from the flock. 
The sheep has gone out into the wilderness where it doesn't belong. The sheep is out there uh, and the shepherd sought that lost sheep. Remember, that's where Jesus said the shepherd leaves the 99 and goes and finds the one that is lost and brings them back and restores them. And you know what that means? Uh, we wander. We get off track in our souls. We get weak in our commitments. We get funky uh, in our times of serving the Lord. We can be living life and get thrown over on our back uh, and we're laying there bah, with our, our legs up in the air and the only hope is that the shepherd comes and finds you and sets you back up on your feet. And he has done that for us so many times, brother and sister. He has helped and brought us back uh, online and set us back on our feet. Uh, amen. Psalm 119, verse 176. I have gone astray like a lost sheep. Seek thy servant, uh, for I do not forget uh, thy uh, commandments. The word gone astray means to vacillate or be out of the way uh, or to be intoxicated. In other words, uh, there are times or even as a sheep, even as a Christian, we can live like a drunk. We can be unstable in our faith. Uh, we can be not uh, where we need to be and doing what we need to be doing. And the world uh, starts looking appealing. We can start nibbling uh, on the, the stuff of the world that is around us. Uh, and we get wandered off uh, and we can do that. But he says here, seek thy servant. In other words, search for me, Lord. Strive after me. Restore me. In other words, sober me up. Help me get back on track. Help me get back uh, where I need to be, doing what I need to be doing, uh, amen, on a, on a regular basis. Uh, and the Lord, that will help us. Uh, Isaiah 53 and verse 6, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. Uh, in other words, brother, sister, we all still have the tendency, no matter how long we've been saved, uh, to do it our way, to choose our way, to choose self-will, over God's will. We all have that within us. Uh, and uh, yet Jesus, think about this, that's a messianic prophecy of Isaiah 53. Uh, and it says there, uh, the Lord laid on him, Jesus, the iniquity of us all. Jesus was crucified to restore the soul of a self-willed sheep. He brings us back. He restores our soul, and when we will come under His Lordship, when we will come under and allow Him to bring us back, allow Him to set us on our feet and get us back on track, then He restores our soul. And I can't tell you in my life how many times I've come to a Wednesday service or another service, and my soul's been reeling, and a sermon, the presence of God, the altar call, and I leave back on my feet, my mind straight, and say, oh, thank God, you've restored my soul again because he restores us brother and sister another thing that God restores is the prodigal this is the person that has made bad choices and they are experiencing the bad results of their sinful choices. Luke 15, 11 through 32 is the story there that Jesus tells about the prodigal son. So here is a young man, he comes of age, and he says to the father, give me the inheritance that belongs to me. His father gives it to him. He leaves, he goes off into the world. The Bible says he spends it on riotous living. He does whatever the world is doing. Amen. He lives the way of the world. He does everything the world's doing. But then the time came, where a famine came, there was trouble in his life, and all of his friends suddenly evaporated. You know, the world is like that, isn't it? They're friends with you as long as you got money. But once you don't got no money, once you don't got no booze, once you don't got no drugs, uh, once you uh, aren't putting out, uh, then we're done with you, and I'm out. And he's all by himself, uh, and he's left feeding the pigs, uh, and you think about this. A Jewish boy that pigs have always been unclean to him. He should never, ever touch pigs. Now he has to clean their stalls. You know what? That's what happens to church kids or prodigals when they backslide. They're all of a sudden in the middle of all this filth that they were not raised in. And they get stuck in that place. Uh, and he's wanting to eat the husks of uh, uh, these 
pigs. Uh, but in verse 17, the hope comes. It says he came to himself. Uh, it might have been on a Wednesday night when he came to himself and remembered that song. There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood. He's out in the pig pen and he says he came to himself and he says, oh, I want to go back to my father's house. He came back in humility. He said to the father, I'm not worthy to be called your son. He didn't come back and say, yeah, I'm back. When can I play the drums? He came back and said, I'm not even worthy to be here. I'm repenting. I, I don't want that anymore came back in humility uh, and I want to tell you something verse 20 and 21 there you read it yourself but I'll describe it to you uh, the Bible says the father has been praying for his son by the way parents or us uh, when they go prodigal you don't go chase them He stayed at the far farm, didn't he, the father? He stayed busy with the farm and the business at home, but he was praying for his son. He's watching, amen, uh, the, the road. Because the Bible says when the son was a great way off, the father left everything and ran out to meet him and embraced him and brought him in and restored him. What did he do in restoration? He put a robe. On him. This is a picture of the robe of righteousness that we wear as Christians. The white robe of righteousness is put back on you, backslider. Hallelujah. You're righteous again. Your sins are forgiven. They're cleansed off of your life. Uh, amen. He put a ring on his finger. It's a picture of the Father's authority that when you had the ring of the leader of the home, you had the authority that backed that ring and, and uh, came from the Father. Uh, he had shoes on his feet, a picture of stability now. He's not crawling around anymore. He's not wandering around. There's stability. There's a steadfastness in his life. And they made a feast for him. Uh, amen. Uh, the acceptance uh, in the beloved. Hey, you're welcome home. Glad you're home. Uh, we're so glad to see you, prodigal. We're so glad you're back. So I want to tell you, backslider, you listen online or you're here. And some of you are here that have come back. And I want to tell you, it is possible for you to be restored. It's possible. In fact, it's probable. In fact, according to the Word of God, it's very real for you. Yes. And yes, you have some bad choices and some bad results. And the truth is, uh, you have to recognize it when you're a backslider coming back. You're still going to deal with some things. You've sown some wild oats. They don't just die overnight. But... The point is, uh, amen, uh, that the Lord, uh, there's not a quick fix. Some things do take time. But if you're humble, if you're repentant as a, as a prodigal that comes home, the Lord can work, uh, the Lord can restore, uh, and you are a candidate for the miracle of restoration if you'll come back right. And there are many prodigals that have come back. And uh, by the way, I urge you to come both services Sunday because you are going to see a miracle in this pulpit. You're going to see a man that used to be a Christian, used to be a pastor, even here, and he went prodigal for a while. But here he is back restored. You're going to see a miracle on Sunday when Brother Victor Vargas comes here to preach, because that's what God does. He restores backsliders. And I want to tell you another one. If you've you got family that's backslidden, don't you give up on those people. You keep praying for them. You keep believing God for them. You keep speaking to them about come home, come back, repent, make it right, quit, quit living in the pig pen. And you know what? You ought to, if you have a child that's a prodigal, I urge you to go to Luke 15 and you do what the father there did. Treat them the same way and God says, you know what? I can give the same results to you and your family. Those prodigals can come home. I believe for that. Another thing God restores is the years. Lost time and lost harvest. And I want to tell you, the longer I serve God, the more this time means something to me. Because you know what? I can't go back anymore. I can't get back opportunities. Verse 25 of our text, I will restore to you the years that the locust has eaten. In other words, there is time 
that has been consumed and wasted. All of the effort in those years of planting, putting fruit in the ground, seed in the ground, uh, cultivating the crops, uh, believing for a harvest, believing that that will come back. The locusts have come and they have devoured it all. So all that time now is lost and all of that potential harvest is gone. And I did a little research on locusts uh, when the swarms come in, uh, like has been happening in Kenya now for a number of months. Uh, amen. These swarms can cover up to hundreds of square kilometers uh, with 15 to 30 million adult locusts. 15 to 30 million adult locusts in each square mile. So a square mile is from here to Peoria Avenue and from here basically to 99th. That's a square mile and there'd be 15 to 30 million locusts in that square mile. These swarms blot out the sun. They're like clouds, uh, and they can eat their own weight in food every day. And these swarms can consume an entire country's food supply in a few days. I want to tell you, in our lives, this happens sometimes. It happens in a church like our church, uh, an older church. Uh, you know what's happened? We've sown some good seed. Um, we believe God for the harvest. Uh, I, like you, have prayed with people. It's like, oh, man, this one's going to make it. Uh, God's going to move on this life. This is going to be the one. Uh, and where are they? They're not, they haven't followed through. They haven't made it. They've been devoured. Uh, it can be true of our families or our children. We raise them in church. Uh, we put the good seed of God's word we bring them to church, we make our stands, uh, and we're ready for the harvest, and then they get devoured, and now they're not here. Um, it can be eaten. Um, so think about this. Before the good can be tasted from what's happening, uh, it is gone. It's devoured. The years, the time, and the harvest. This is true for backsliders. One of the biggest things backsliders wrestle with is regret. If only... I would not have done that. Because the backslider realizes there's things gone by. They can't get those years back. But it can also be true for saints. You know, years can go by. Did you know it's the end of 2020? Most of us are like, praise the Lord. <laughs> I saw a meme the other day. It had a slide. And a kid coming down the slide, it said, this is like 2020, but the slide was a cheese grater. <laughs> it's kind of how it feels this year, doesn't it? The year's been consumed, right? It's just... Whoa. But I want to tell you, time... Amen. Can be lost. The harvest can be lost and not redeemed for whatever the reason may be. Uh, and uh, but this state of life, God says, I promise to restore it. I can turn back the clock. God can do in a thousand years what in one day. God can do what uh, fills up a thousand years in one day. God can restore time. Restore means to be completed in our text, to finish to make whole or make good or to make an end of. And yes, there's a reality. Amen. Time can never be brought back. You know, you can't relive, uh, you know, December 8th, uh, 2020. That was yesterday. You can't relive yesterday. Whatever opportunities were there are gone. But God, amen, uh, uh, can bring uh, years that are restored. God can make you productive in the new moment, in the new day, uh, that it brings back, amen, and gives more more than what you lost. Philippians 1, 6, It is God that works in you both to will and to do of His good pleasure. God is at work inside of your life, in my life, uh, and He is working His will. He is working His pleasure. He is working His purposes. He is working that within us, even in all of our shortcomings, even in the times uh, that we've wasted or been lost, uh, whatever it may be. Uh, any life entrusted to God's hand is a candidate for the years being restored. The other thing God restores that I'm touching on tonight is relationships. There are times in relationships where there is conflict and then 
There is distance. Conflict. And then distance. Genesis 37 through 45 is the whole story of Joseph and his brothers. These very, very close relationships. And may I remind you, uh, you know, the Jewish culture, they were very, very tight-knit, much like a Hispanic culture, very, very linked together. But Joseph and his brothers had some hostility come down. They had some distance that came. Remember Joseph, uh, he's the young man, he's the youngest brother, uh, and he gets this special coat from dad, uh, and he wears it out, uh, and he says, yeah, bros, check me out. Look what dad gave me. And by the way, I've had a dream. And in my dream, there's 11 sheaves um, and all y'all are bowing down to my sheave. Y'all going to bow down to me. This is a kid about 15 years old and he's talking to older brothers that are, you know, 30, 40 years old. He's like, what you talking about, boy? You know how brothers are. He has pride. Joseph is full of pride and he's bragging about this. He's, he's throwing it in his brother's face. Well, his brothers get a little bit ticked off. And his brothers say, okay, fine, you know, we're, we're, we're going to deal with you. And they take his little coat of many colors, uh, and they rip it off, uh, and they throw him down in a pit, uh, and uh, they're going to just betray him, and actually they thought to kill him. Uh, but Judas said, no, 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 don't kill him. Uh, let's spare him. We don't want to have that blood on our hands. So instead they said, okay. So the Ishmaelites come by, and they sell their brother into slavery. Then they take the coat. They smear some blood on it. They take it to dad and say, hey, we found this out there. You figure out what it is. It's my son's coat. And J Jacob freaks out, right? So now there's conflict. Now there's been envy. Now there's been pride. Now there's been betrayal. Now there's been all these things. And now Joseph is in Egypt. He's far, far away. And the brothers just keep living life. But in time, we know the story, God maneuvered Joseph. Now he is the prime minister of Egypt. He's the second in command under Pharaoh in all of Egypt. And a famine comes that God sent. And the brothers have to come to Egypt. And when they come to Egypt, they all bow down to their little brother. Just like the dream said. And they have to get food from him. And remember, he, he, he maneuvers with them a little bit. And you want to know that what that's all about. He's getting them to see their guilt. That's what he's doing. He's, getting, he's wanting them to see if they recognize what they did. Because you know, you can never resolve something until you face it. Right? Get the issues on the table. It ain't going to work by just pretending. You got to get the issues on the table. And so he brings them to that point. Uh, they figure it out. Uh, they bring his little brother Benjamin. Uh, and finally Joseph reveals himself to them. Uh, and this uh, mighty, mighty miracle happens. Genesis 45, 3 and 4. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Does my father yet live? And his brother could not answer him. For they were peeing their pants. Oh no, I mean they were troubled at his presence. And Joseph said to his brothers, come near to me, I pray you. And they came near and he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. So here they are trembling. They are alarmed. But here is this picture of moving restoration. Because as you read it through, you find out Joseph isn't angry and bitter and wanting revenge. He wants to heal. He wants to be helpful in this. And he has some interesting statements that he makes in verse 14 and 15 there of Genesis 45. or It's the, the picture, sorry, of restoration. He fell on his brother Benjamin's neck and wept. Benjamin wept on his neck and he kissed all his brethren, wept with them and after this his brethren talked with him. This is what only God can do. God healed a major rift 
And God brought a restoration of relationship. Not only was the rift healed, but the family became close again because all of Joseph's brothers and Jacob, his father, moved from Canaan and they moved to be with him in Egypt. Uh, so remember, uh, relationships have conflict and distance, uh, but God restored and re uh, brought restoration in the conflict, uh, healing, uh, and then he brought them close again. What brethren do you have conflict with? What people have there have been some issues with? And I'm not talking about people you have to make a stand with that are sinful and all that. That's, that's a different issue. I'm talking about brethren. I'm talking about people in the church. I'm talking about saved family members. Is there distance there? There's been a conflict who do you stay away from? Who do you have to plan around? Did you know God's able to restore your relationships with those people? And did you know God wants to do that? If both parties have humble and right hearts and in God's timing and way, there can be the miracle of restoration in that relationship again. He did it for Joseph and his brothers. He can do it for us. And he does it for us. So I want to close with why God restores. We've been talking about what God restores. So let's think finally about what or why, sorry, why God restores. One is God does it to give revelation of his character. See, when you see a miracle of restoration, you know what you see? You see a snapshot of God. God's nature, God's love, God's power. Again, Joseph, this man, an amazing restoration that was obviously God. Yet a little bit later, his father died and his brothers come back to him and say, Hey, 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 don't forget, don't forget. Be merciful to us, because listen, he's the second in command of Egypt. At any moment, he could say whatever he wants, and everyone will do exactly what he says. He could kill them in a moment of time. No one would even question the decision. And they come to him and say, hey, dad's dead now. Please remember mercy, right? Remember these things. And Joseph had an interesting response. Verse 20 of Genesis 50. He said, as for you, you thought evil against me. But God meant it unto good. To bring it to pass as it is this day to save many people alive. The word thought and meant in the verse is the same word. It means to fabricate or to have a plot or a plan or to think to do. So think about this. The brothers made a plan and fabricated evil and harm and problems and damage. But God at the same time was fabricating and weaving and planning like it happened right there. Restoration and then all the family saved. Which by the way, that's why we're saved. Because see, if Jacob had died in the famine and all of his sons, there would be no Jesus. God's word version, even though you planned evil, God planned good to come out of it. Why? To save many people alive. What's, listen, brother, sister, you want to know the greatest revelation of God's character and love? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. The whole point of God's character is to restore sinful people to himself. Right? That's, that's what he's all about. That's who he is. God is love in that way. And so this is a picture of saving many people alive. God's plan didn't just involve Joseph. It didn't just involve the brothers. It involved the whole family. And like I said, it involved all of us. Because, oh, God's plan 
in the middle of people planning evil and problems and conflict and all that went on, God was fabricating, devising, planning this amazing result. So I have a question for you. In your difficulty, in your trouble, maybe in conflict, in whatever you're going through, what amazing plan is God working for you? Because the devil means things for evil, doesn't he? Right? People can mean things for evil like the brothers. But God weaves it, means it, fabricates it for good. Because see, this is God's character. God is so faithful to turn the tables on the devil. God always has the last word. He can turn around any situation for his purpose, for his glory, for his name to be honored in your life and in that situation. So I want to encourage you in it. God restores because he's revealing his nature. God's not content to leave you covered with dirt, damaged, and that relationship looking like that. God's plan is to restore it. Because that's who God is. And maybe your faith tonight needs to go up, that you recognize that's the God you serve. Well, God can't move in my family. Why not? Let him. Trust him. The other reason God restores is revival. Very interesting in our text, isn't it? You know, we read verses 25 through 27, restoration, all this, but then it goes right into the prophecy that, the birth, that birthed the church in the book of Acts. It shall come to pass in the last days, saith the Lord, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Right? Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. On my servants and handmaidens in those days will I pour out my spirit. What happens here? When God works restoration, you know what else he gives? Revival. Straying saints. You know what's a blessing when you stray? Is when you get back right, you have revival. You have a little personal revival going on. Man, God, thank you for your mercy for me, God. Thank you that you brought me home. Thank, when you're a prodigal, when you're a backslider and you come back, when you do it right, you know what you have? Revival. I praise God, I can come to church again, man. I'm not outside the camp. I'm welcome inside the beloved. And I want to be here and I'm allowed to be here. The lost years, the conflicts, each arena can be brought in line and there be a revival there. And let's be real, every one of those arenas hinders God. Okay, when our soul is double-minded, what does the Bible say? A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. He will receive nothing from the Lord. Okay, when, you're, you're, when our soul is straying, it hinders God working in our lives. But when we get back right, when we get restored, then you know what? The flow of God comes again. You know, a prodigal, uh, I have a purpose in God. I have a call of God. I have the will of God. Well, yes, God's plans and call doesn't change. But your sin right now is stopping that from happening. And when you come back, you get restored. What happens? Like a Victor Vargas or a Bob Burris, you get back on track. Revival. What happens in uh, conflict amongst the brethren? Well, the Bible says in our Bible reading, um, you know, today, by the way, this morning, Psalm 133, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Because there the Lord commands blessing life forevermore. So when there's conflict in a church, when there's problems in relationships, you know what happens in your family? You stop the flow of God. Well, you don't know what they did to me. You're right. But do you know what you did to Jesus? Your sin put him on the cross. He forgave you. And he calls you to forgive them. And the truth is, the way a church often has revival is when there's healing in relationships. And your family. How does your family have revival? How can you have a merry Christmas with your family instead of a Christmas like, here we go again? 
Well, humble yourself, forgive, extend grace, extend forgiveness. Well, I'm waiting for them to talk to me. Is that what God did to you? Did God just wait for you to figure it out? Oh, no, no, he came and found you. He came and offered forgiveness to you when you were at your worst, most rebellious state against the Lord. What, right? All of us. So actually, if you're a spiritual person, you'll offer that first. Reconciliation. And so if you'll do that, you'll have a miracle. You'll have the work uh, of revival that comes uh, because when the miracle of restoration comes, God's work powers forward. God's building continues. Uh, the project can get forward and get moving again, and you have revival. That's what happens. Because they're linked together in the text, right? Restoration, some things need to be resolved, yes. But let God work. Involve yourself in the process. Let God help. And then God's life and power and grace. Don't you want the Spirit of God poured out on you? Don't you want our young men to see visions? Don't you want our young ladies in the church and your children and your family to be filled with the Holy Ghost on fire for God? Don't we want that? Then we, we have to work on restoration. We have to get some issues in order. Let God restore. Stop driving around the beat-up Corvette. When we work together, when we agree, when we ask God for His work of restoration, the dimension of revival in, in Acts, uh, in Joel 2, which is Acts 2, pours out. Remember in Acts 2, they were all with one accord in one place. They were one. There was no division. There was no strife. And that brought revival. So God restores because of revelation and because he wants to give revival. So I want to encourage everybody here, anyone, that you're in need of restoration. You're online maybe. You're a backslider or you're here and you've been straying. You've been not quite right with God and you know it. The devil beats you up. We have our own failures. Maybe you're out wandering in the wilderness and you're not where you need to be in your spirit, in your mind, in your, in your focus. Then get back. Amen. Come on back. Get it, get it right at the altar. Cry out for God's touch because God's in the restoration business. This is what God does. The key is that you and I would surrender and be humble before God and say, Lord, you know what? Not what I want in this situation because what we want is often, you know, to hurt them because they hurt us. But that's not the spirit of Jesus. Say, Lord, I want what you want in this situation. I want what you want. And surrender to the Lord. I leave you with a few verses here. Isaiah 57 and verse 15, thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit to revive or restore the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. A humble and broken heart. God will revive and restore. Psalm 34, verse 18. The Lord is near unto them that have a broken heart and saves such as be of a contrite spirit. And the final one is Psalm 51, written by David after he had sinned and been restored. He would know, wouldn't he? The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. So I want to urge you, come under the work in the hand of the great ultimate restorer. Whatever the area may be, he's in that business and he knows what he's about. We serve a good God. He don't want to leave you in the pit. He don't want to leave you all banged up. 
He's working to bring his restoration. I don't know about you, but I saw these and I was like, man, what a difference, right? Oh, what a difference the hand of God makes. So I want to encourage you in that tonight. Let's bow our heads together. Appreciate you, church. The ultimate restorer. Our God. Our God. Maybe you're here and you're not saved or you're backslidden. You know, the thing all of us need the most, the top priority, is to get right with God. You know, if you're a sinner, you've never been saved before, you know, the, the problem is you've lived a default life in a broken way. We all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's not one righteous, not even one. We all sin. We all do wrong. And we, that sin breaks our relationship with our Creator. We're not right with God because we're living in sin. But Jesus has come to forgive that sin. He already paid the price. And you know what He can do? He can take a life that has been damaged by sin, a mind that has been blown out on mushrooms and drugs, a, a health that's been damaged and messed up families and relationships and a record. Or even maybe you haven't done all that stuff, but you're just, you're just living your own life. No connection to God, no joy, nothing satisfies anymore. You're living separate from your Creator and He wants to restore a right relationship with you. That's why Jesus came and tonight if you'll receive that, you'll humble yourself and repent, you can have that. Backslider, there's some in this room that have already made this decision. They've come back and you know what? God has done an amazing work of restoration. Hey Amen, I'm, I'm not gonna name who she is, but there's a young lady, uh, a lady Amen, that when I was here in the past, amen, there was a certain dynamic. And then after salvation, after restoration, what a different dynamic. Because they got restored. They got saved. What a difference, backslider, the hand of God makes. If you will come under Him again, and you'll turn from your sin. And please know this, they didn't leave these Corvettes down in that hole they went in there and got him out. And all oh, backslider, the Lord Jesus is not content that you're stuck. He wants to bring you home if you let him, if you'll respond, if you'll work with him. He'll help you, he'll restore you. Our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. There's hope for you tonight in Jesus. Amen. You're unsaved or backslidden. You want to get it right with God. Would you lift up your hand and just say, yeah, that's me. I, I'm not right, but I want to get right. I want to get right with my creator. I'm tired of my sin. I want to live for Jesus. Anybody at all, lift your hand. I mean, maybe you're online. You would respond. Anybody at all in the room here, you lift your hand. God's dealing with you. Okay, I, online. I, I don't do this every time, but I'm going to do it tonight, and I feel prompted to do it. Maybe you're out there, and God's dealing with you, and you want to pray a prayer of restoration and repentance, and I want to encourage you right now. Just repeat after me out online. Say, Lord Jesus... I know that I am a sinner. I'm not living right in your sight. But I turn away from my sins. And I humble myself before the living God. I pray you'll be merciful to me. And forgive me of all my sins. I commit my life to you. Please restore me to the person you created me to be. I thank you for your mercy and your forgiveness. The blood of Jesus sets me free and cleanses me now. I pray this in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Church, I want you to pray with me for those online right now. Agree with me right now. God, I lift up these people, God, that would hear this message, Lord, that would pray, God, that prayer. I'm asking you to visit them in the privacy of their own home or wherever they may be. And I pray a miracle of salvation and restoration to come to them. Draw them to yourself, Lord God, with your cords of mercy and powerfully work on them and bless them and use their life for your glory. And I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. So church, I wanna ask you to stand with me. Maybe there's an area, maybe there's something that tonight God has showed you that needs some restoration. Maybe you're already in the process, but you know what? It's easy sometimes to lose hope. It, these, these Corvettes took some time. I saw the pictures of the process and it's pieces sometimes. And sometimes it's pieces. We don't see it all, but don't lose your hope, my brother, my sister. God's working his restoration. And maybe you have someone you're praying for, a backslider, a loved one. That's not right. You know what? Don't give up on them. Don't give up on them. Keep serving God yourself and keep praying for them. Keep believing for them. And I want to encourage you, maybe at the altar, whatever it is, that you would come and you'd put your hands in the hand, your, your life in the hands of your Lord, the ultimate restorer, and uh, come and do that here tonight at this altar. Go ahead and sing, Lalo. We fall down. We lay our crowns at the feet of Jesus. We fall down. Give the Lord praise and thanks and glory tonight. I love you, Jesus. Praises and glory, Lord. Hallelujah. You know, the fact that all of us if we make it to heaven, when we get there, it's going to be because of His hand. That's it. We're not going to toe the line and be perfect for the rest of our life. We're not going to just do everything right, no matter who we are or what we do. And we're going to have our times. And it doesn't mean that, you know, some people, well, it's just who I am. And they continue in the way of the flesh and of sin. That's wrong. You ought to be trying to change. Amen? 
right? So if you walk in the Spirit, you won't fulfill the lusts of the flesh. The Lord's always calling us to walk more in the Spirit. But I just want to extend to you, brother, uh, uh, just uh, an understanding. You're upheld by God's grace. It's by grace that you are saved, the Scripture says. And it's by grace that you stand, that you stay saved. It's not because we earn it now, because we, you know, know all the check marks. We're only saved by God's grace all the way through. And that means we, we don't want to despise that. We don't want to stomp that underfoot by just doing what we want. Right? We want to walk in carefulness. We want to walk in reverence and humility. But when you do that, you have God's grace. And I want to tell you, He's going to restore. He's going to work. And so I want to encourage you, amen, tonight. Go in victory. Go in peace. Go in the joy of the Lord. And you may not be the finished product yet. In fact, none of us are. We're all still getting there, okay? Now, if they would donate this to me, <laughs> then I'd be a step further along the road of being complete. Right? But none of us are. We all have some work to do and God's working on us. But just know this. It's Him that's working His good pleasure of His will in your life. It's not your performance. It's Him working with you and helping you. So if He's talking to you, dealing with you, then respond, change, right? Grow. But then be, be, be at ease. He brought us out of the pit. And he's bringing us to glory. To glory. He's, he is able to present you faultless before his throne. Can you imagine that? Faultless? Faultless. That's a miracle, man, because we all have faults. But it's all covered by the blood, right? That's what it is. So you keep serving God, keep going. He's working his restoration. So encourage all of you. Amen. And I want to encourage you to speak that uh, to the backslider. You know, sometimes I've dealt with backsliders. And you know what you want to do to the backslider? Get them and say, psh, psh, wake up. What's wrong with you? You're in the pig pen. <laughs> How about you tell them something different? How about you say, you know what? And it, I would advise you to this. Find someone in the church that's backslidden before and see what brought them back. Because it wasn't always the punch. Sometimes it's, you know what? God still loves you. God will still change your life. God will still use your life. Give them a message of hope this time, this time around and try something. Instead of just bashing them every time, how about you try a different strategy? Try the strategy of the restorer. You know what, bro, sis, whoever you are, dad, mom, whatever, God can restore you back to where you belong. God still has a plan for you. Give them some hope. Because not only is the backslider dealing with their own faults and sins, but the devil's riding them. You can never repent. You can never get back. You can never make it back. You've gone too far. The devil's telling them that in their ear all the time. And you can be a voice that says, you know what? No, no, no. God's bigger than what you did. God can restore you and bring you home. And so I encourage you in that. Let's try, and just as God would lead you, but just something to think about and pray about and believe God for, okay? Amen. We so appreciate you. We'll let you go. Please, parents, don't forget, if your children are in the play, they need to be here tomorrow at 6, a speaking part. Uh, not everybody, but just those with speaking parts. They need to practice and, and get this down very well and uh, be ready for the end of the month. And we appreciate the parents already. 6 o'clock tomorrow, and you pick them up at 6 p.m. on Friday night. And so, oh no, sorry, 7.30 on Thursday night. I'm trying to give you guys a date night. and they're... Anyways, amen. Uh, they'll be here ready to go for that. So amen, God bless you. Let's bow our heads and be dismissed in prayer. Amen, I'm going to ask my brother, amen, Omar, please, brother, dismiss us. Amen. God bless you tonight.